Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Scott Hutel, who is Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. Research in his lab investigates the brain mechanisms underlying economic and social decision-making. Welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your older papers, um, Decision Neuroscience, Neuroeconomics. Um, you say a few aspects of human cognition are more personal than the choices we make. Our decisions from the mundane to the impossibly complex continually shape the courses of our lives. In recent years, researchers have applied the tools of neuroscience to understand the mechanisms that underlie decision making as part of the new discipline of decision neuroscience. I'm very interested in this area, Scott. I have done some work in, um, in economic decisions, especially economic decisions under uncertainty. Mm-hmm and uh, often wondered uh, how the brain is actually doing this stuff. <laughs> so yeah. uh, do you want to talk a bit about uh, what you mean by decision neuroscience? Yeah, so this is a pretty new field. So it started uh, probably about 20 years ago. And in scientific terms, that's quite new. And the core idea was that many of the um, sort of anomalies or biases we see in, in choice behavior may actually reflect some principles that are mechanisms that underlie our choices. And so a number of us, when the field was growing, had this idea that if we could understand better how the brain helps shape our choices, we might have better insight into things like what you're talking about, about, for example, the different biases people show when making decisions under uncertainty. And so as a field, we, it, it, we grew up trying to understand many of the things that economists and psychologists have been looking at for 50, 100 years through a lens of brain function. And that actually revealed some new insights into these sort of anomalies that people have been looking at for decades. Yeah, so, um, so th- um, if you can talk a little bit about sort of decisions under uncertainty, uh, it's an area, you know, there is a little bit of a debate, uh, even after hundreds, hundreds of years uh, in economics um, and finance, um, how you think about value. Mm-hmm. Um, we still uh, sort of, you know, reduce it into some sort of deterministic equation. Um, uh, spreadsheets have done a disservice, uh, I argue, uh, that uh, that allows people to put a bunch of numbers into a spreadsheet and divide it or discount it using a discount rate and come up with a value. Uh, but often we don't actually use that value at all in business decision making. It is sort of a feel good uh, process um, that billions of dollars are spent in consulting and investment banking and everywhere else uh, on on all decision making, but never actually used. And so. So it will be interesting from your perspective when you when you think about how the brain does it, how the brain makes a decision under uncertainty, 
what do we see? Um, so, so you looked at where the activities might be and, and so on, right? That might give us some insights. Yeah, that's right. So my lab actually was one of the first, uh, now 15 years ago, that tried to break apart different elements of uncertainty. So if you take the, t the, the that term uncertainty, that you can think of that, at least I think of that, as sort of a subjective sense that we all feel, that we, yeah. we don't know what the outcome of our choice will be. But economists and psychologists over decades have actually broken it apart. So yeah. there's lots of different levels, but the most common distinction is between something called risk, which would be something like known probabilities, you can imagine in gambling, and ambiguity, sometimes called Knightian uncertainty, which is a case where you don't know probabilities and or you don't know the distribution of outcomes. And these in theory, can be treated the same. So as you note, uh, economists, some, many economists have, have decided and said that, that you could optimize over and over ambiguity. Even if you don't know the probabilities, you just sort of assume something about their distribution and then move on. Right. And so we showed um, in my lab that, that actually risk and ambiguity are tracked at least in part by different brain mechanisms. Hmm. And so over the succeeding decade, uh, neuroscientists have been trying to understand what does it mean for something as subjective uncertainty to be sort of broken apart in the brain such that depending on what the uncertainty is, you have different brain mechanisms that help you deal with it. So do we have so, some sort of evolutionary analog to it? Uh, I would imagine um, where, when Homo sapiens, you know, were trying to, uh, trying to survive, there were two types of uncertainties, right? Uh, perhaps uh, history, um, maybe water holes, um, where the where the lion might be. Uh, historical observations might have given some some expectation of that that distribution, uh, but then they often encounter um, ambiguity that that has no dis prior distribution. So, so so do um, do we know if the uh, what we see in the brain is actually a function of the the evolutionary aspects of it? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, these sorts of evolutionary stories are always difficult, um, at least on the scale that we can look at in human human behavior. Um, there's a couple of things that argue I think are relevant for your argument. One is that most of what we see is actually conserved across humans and other species. Uh, let's say we one neat feature of decision neuroscience is that many things we can do, we, we do in both humans and in other species. So people have looked at risk and ambiguity in non-human primates and even in rats. And yeah. although rat in, the rat and human brains are, don't have all them, I mean, they, they have less homology, but you can look at a, at a monkey brain, which has a considerable matching to the human brain and see really similar regions that are tracking risk and ambiguity in a monkey brain as that you see in a human brain. So it's probably not human specific. And one of the yeah. things that I find interesting is that, that even though we often talk about risk, there's been essentially no evolutionary selection pressure for risk per se. I mean, if you think about what risk is, it's a modern construction. Before gambling, before banking, there was no risk per se. Everything was ambiguity. Right. Well, I actually, I actually think risk is the weird one that's the one that our brains are not adapted for, and that our brain really is more adapted for cases where we have to figure out the probabilities. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, wouldn't you say um, when you start off, everything is ambiguous, you get some observations, brain would presumably store those observations, and in, and in subsequent similar encounters would have an estimation of risk, even if they're not calling it risk, even if the... You, you, you know, we don't systematically call it risk. Wouldn't the brain have prior observations that it has stored? Yeah, so I think what you're getting at is a change in how we should think about the decision-making process. So yeah. we often would say, I'm going to present somebody a choice and have them make, let's say, a risky choice. Which would you rather have, the, the sure $100 or a coin flip for $300? And that sort of choice we do in the lab looks a lot like gambling out in the world, may look a lot like investing in some cases. Those, those are the weird choices, but you're exactly right. In the natural world, we don't get give, we're not always given numerical choices. In fact, we, we might just have to choose based on our experiences. So yeah. research over the last 10 years or so has been very interested in the processes of learning and how those processes of learning might even differ across different contexts. So you might learn one way based upon physical experiences like 
food you eat or, or juices you drink, the experiences you have, a different way about numbers and even a different way about social information. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you have done some experiments around this, right? Um, asking people to make decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to uh, explain, uh, you know, one of those things that might give us uh, sort of a context? Yeah. So we often will run experiments in which people are faced with choices that have different properties. So as I'm to take it the simplest case, we give people choices that might have all the information available to them or missing information. So in our first study, we did this, we left out probability information. So you might know what you could win, but you don't know your chances. And it turns out that when you give people those ambiguous cases, there are specific regions of the prefrontal cortex that come online and specifically for ambiguity and not for cases like risk. Now, the reason that's important is because we can then link the brain regions to other things we know about those regions based on clinical studies or based on other experiments to get an idea of their functions. So what the decision neuroscience really allows us to do is take a situation like that and by looking at the brain gives a better sense of specific processes. Like in the case of ambiguity, it seems like there are regions that are actually constructing the choice in real time, that it, they're, they're trying to identify or learn the probabilities based upon past experience. And those regions come out uh, preferentially for ambiguity, but not in cases where the information is already there in risk. Different regions of the brain seem to be involved when there's information is already in front of you. Well, yeah. So we can generalize that approach to other, to other types of paradigms as well, and basically try to build up sort of the, the, the core blocks that we use, when our core tools we use when making decisions. Yeah, th this is fascinating, Scott. So, you know, in business context, what, what one type of decision um, that we make is sort of sequential decisions. Uh, and so you make a decision today and you wait for a, a period of time and you have an outcome um, from, you know, from that uh, that has some probabilistic expectation of happening. And then based on that, you will make another decision. And so you have you know, uh, some uncertainties evolving stochastically, some uncertainties showing up probabilistically. And we combine all of this uh, in a way that, that provides us an economic value of different options that we are looking at. Now, we can do this mathematically really well. <laughs> now, the question has always been, managers of the firm, do they actually do this systematically? Yeah. Or, or is it really just, you know, seat of the pants decision making? That's what we, we actually see. Uh, but but um, do we see anything from your experiments that we are making efficient decisions? Well, so that's a wonderful, a wonderful question. I think you're hitting at one of the core challenges for the research that, that, in some ways, the types of optimal models that economists and then manage, management, people in management of firms have come up with um, aren't always expressed by individuals in everyday decisions. So when you say we, can, we yeah. can calculate things very, very well, what I think you mean is that using computer tools, we can optimize, right. say, the value of an option. But that's not what people yeah. do. I mean, my favorite anecdote about this is, and I, I don't think it's even apocryphal, I think it's a real one. So Harry Markowitz, who's famous as sort of the inventor of portfolio theory, was asked right. how he would invest himself. And he says, yeah. I put half my money in stocks and half the money, money in bonds because I, <laughs> I want to be covered either way. So even the right. single person who allows us all to do these sort of optimizations in our own portfolios used a simple heuristic, a simple rule putting half in risky and half in safer investments. And I really think that's what people do is that, that in it, their natural tendency is to try to find a simple, good enough rule to help us make these decisions. And it's hard for us to try to do the sort of optimization that you're talking about. So is it, uh, is it because of the cognitive cost issue? Brain is, you know, a very highly uh, resource consumptive organ. Uh, sometimes potentially a bit lazy. So if um, if it if it uh, sort of looks at cognitive cost and say I'm getting you know the next best solution by using a simple rule, why should I spend more time trying to optimize it? Is that what yeah, I think? That's the core. Although I'm gonna give a little nuance to that. And so what you're describing yeah. is is the idea that a heuristic is a simplification. So like when I say something, I'm just gonna pick half in stocks, half in bonds. 
I'm simplifying something to a good enough solution. And so that's the traditional story. And I think, and, I, and that's what I've thought throughout my career. But over the last few years, I've come to realize something that, that in many cases, it turns out these rules aren't, we don't use these simple rules only because they're simple. We actually also use them because they're optimal. And so this can be seen in other contexts beside investing, but but it, there's a camp in research now that argues that heuristics or simple rules that we use turn out to be not just fast, but also optimal in a structured world, in the world we actually live in. And so we may actually be using these simple rules because they really do help us make better decisions, not just easier ones. Right. And, and those heuristics... Um... Let me let me see if I can ask this properly. Uh, is this sort of a societal heuristic that we all share, or is it is it you know every person is developing those heuristics from scratch? So I think there's there's a lot of commonality, and so one of the features of a human behavior is in general there's more commonality than there is difference, and so you and I and everybody else listening will have almost like a similar toolkit of heuristics. So like, for example, um, one of the most powerful ones in many simple real world choices is familiarity, that we tend to prefer yeah. things with which we're familiar. And that could be political candidates or restaurants or anything else. If it's familiar, it's more likely to be good or popular or better or so forth. Um, that heuristic everyone shows. And the degree to which we rely on it or the circumstances in which we rely on it will differ from person to person. But everyone shows that heuristic. And so there's a lot that are like that, where it's, it's, there's a general rule we all use, but you might use familiarity, for example, for restaurants, but not when investing, or somebody else might use it in investing, but then do a lot of analysis while shopping. Right, right. Yeah, so, so you know, um, as you know, artificial intelligence is making big strides. Uh, we have this deep neural networks. Uh, if you have a lot of data, we can train it uh, to, you know, to make certain types of decisions. Um, and um, oftentimes we need large amounts of data to do so, as you know. Um, but often humans can do this or, or learn these types of heuristics with very little data. Um, and that sort of put a, a damper on our uh, progress toward understanding the brain from a computing perspective. What is, what is your... You are you know, I think that. that's that's a core challenge for us. Because you're exactly right that there are many things that we can identify with um, with complex analysis tools. So like uh, often it's thought if you want to try to optimize a decision problem, you can train a machine learning algorithm on a large data set and it'll tell you the optimal. Um, one of the, yeah. the, the things that I've grown, grown excited about is the tension between that and simplification. So let me give you an example. Um, this is not my work. This is Gerd Gagerenzer's work. But they were interested, they had a, they had a client, uh, a major, I think it was a department store, who was interested in finding out which of their shoppers would come back if they, um, who were the basically, like, who should they market to because they might purchase again over a period of time. And so they trained this machine learning algorithm on this huge data set, and it was outperformed by one rule. And the rule was if they if the customer had shopped at the store in the last six months, then they're likely to shop again. And the reason why that turns out to be an optimal rule is that that explained more than half of the variance in the data. And if you do that, right. then a, no algorithm can actually do better. It's, and so what it is, if, if the world is highly structured so that there are, are in fact, some there's some like some deep regularity, like if you shop in the past, it predicts you'll shop in the future then that actually turns out to outperform even these sort of optimal algorithms because algorithms overfit. They make some mistakes. And so that's what's really cool. If the world is structured, then simple rules are effective. If the world is not structured, like in, say, let's say, stock market investing, then simple rules may be counterproductive. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I think your intuition about these heuristics are not only simplistic, uh, but also optimum. Uh, it's a good one. So, you know, um, for instance, you know, people ask, why do uh, senior execs get paid a lot of money? And, and and one argument is that they're actually pretty good at what they do. They cannot really actually tell you how they make decisions, uh, but they make decisions um, 
pretty close to optimum. Um, not all of them, but you know, many of them. And they have reached or created those heuristics by multiple experiments, a lot of failures, experience, and so on. And so, so the argument is that there is a premium to experience, but there's also a downside to it, right? Uh, because experience also comes with a set of, set of biases. Uh, those heuristic, heuristics may not be flexible enough uh, when the regime mm-hmm. changes. And so, so we see this now in modern context, perhaps as, as we were evolving, say 50,000 years ago, the regimes were not that dynamic that experience had a lot more value. But in the modern context, we find heuristics and experience-based heuristics uh, perhaps not of high value. Uh, do you yeah, I, I generally do. I think, I think there's, there's perhaps some simpler, simple ways to, in fact, think about when a heuristic, and again, a heuristic is, um, I'll just define as some case where you just take a complex situation and use a simple rule. There's, there's, there's a way of thinking about when those heuristics are likely to be adaptive. So if the heuristic... Yeah is something that you've had a lot of experience applying. And if the world is highly structured, I mean, it, has, it follows sort of natural or physical rules, then the heuristic is likely to be very good. So for example, if you say, I want to figure out if I want to go to a restaurant and you've heard of the restaurant, just simple familiarity, it's likely to be something that is pretty good because familiar restaurants tend to be shared and or good restaurants tend to be shared with others and bad restaurants don't. So you can have experiences, and that makes that a useful heuristic. Um, dentists or physicians who have a lot of experience with one procedure can look at a X-ray or look at something and almost instantly know the likely course of action because of that experience allows them to simplify the complex problem. But actually, things like investing and paradoxically really big decisions tend to be um, mm-hmm. less amenable to heuristics. So I'm actually not so sure. Uh, uh, the one thing I'll disagree with from before, I'm not so sure about the justification for CEO pay because most CEOs, mm-hmm. by definition, don't make a lot of big decisions. The really field-changing yeah. ones are precisely rare because the CEOs don't have to do them daily. Um, and so right. I would evaluate a CEO or any professional by looking at the decisions that he or she makes on an everyday basis commonly not the rare big decisions, because the rare big ones are more subject to change. More subject to change. And and there's a dynamic aspect to it that is, you know, increasingly um, more difficult too. Uh, so adaptive heuristics, um, you know, increasingly we have in AI learning systems that can incorporate emerging data in an adaptive fashion at least from what I have seen in, in real life, in business context, uh, human brains don't appear to be highly adaptive. Once they reach uh, a, a state of high experience, high, not high, but set of heuristics that they created over time, they don't able to change very quickly. Is that what you observe or you, well, you so, have a different view? So the, one way to distinguish, uh, one difference might be between are we able to adopt completely new heuristics, completely different new rules quickly? And no, it's those, that's very hard, especially these, the, the rules that we adopt for everyday life are powerful precisely because we've learned them over time. They've tended to be applicable yeah. to a lot of circumstances. And so if the world changes rapidly, then it's harder to use those. So the term for this we often use in decision science is volatility. When the world is volatile, then you really should be jumping around a lot, trying new things. But the human brain does have difficulty dealing with volatility, that we have a hard time recognizing when we're in a different, completely different circumstances than what's worked in the past. Right, right. I want to uh, jump into another paper that's sort of related, but, um, but uh, you know, looking at, so it says uh, translating upwards, linking the neural and social sciences via neuroeconomics. So what you're saying here is that a lot of different fields that, um, that have these types of ideas, they have developed some techniques, they're borrowing from other fields, they're sort of interconnected, and you have a map of different scientific communities. That's right. Here, right? So, so with some colleagues from the Netherlands, we, we did some, some things that I, I, I'm almost shocked they worked, which is we tried to map a scientific discipline. And the field of decision neuroscience and neuroeconomics yeah. was still small enough and new enough that we could do that. 
and we built a couple of different maps. One map was of how the words and papers talk to each other. Like if I write a paper, I might cite other papers. And you can actually create a social network of how papers interact with each other. And one thing we found was that trying to understand this, the brain base of the decision making was impossibly broad. What I mean by that is that it pulled upon research in all these different areas, much broader than any other one we could find. And so what that really meant was that it's, it's, it's something that hasn't ossified into a little discipline yet. It's still something that's pulling from throughout all of science. And the other thing we looked at was actually how people talk to each other. So uh, one of the colleagues of the paper is a sociologist of science, and he was interested in, in social connections between researchers. So we could survey pretty much everybody who works in this field and see who they talk to and how they cluster. And we could create little communities. And it was sort of cool because you could find that the communities that were more central and influential in this network were the ones that were balanced between neuroscientists and social scientists. So in trying to understand this, this scientific problem, if you were just looking at it from the brain perspective or just looking at it from, say, the economics perspective, you weren't going to be as successful. Your group wasn't as influential as when it was integrated. Yeah, I mean, we see this in, um, you know, in many different areas. Most of the innovation today, as you know, Scott, is happening at the intersection of disciplines. And uh, it has implications, I think, for it's not in the paper, but I want to get your perspective on it. Uh, implications for education, uh, as well as for, for uh, policy makers uh, and their background. So in education, we still appear to be, you know, sort of perpetuating maybe 30, 40, 50 year old designs that requires a deep dive into certain disciplines uh, on the premise that when you come out, you have the skills to go get a job. But there are no jobs in a, in a specific discipline anymore. The jobs are actually at the intersection of multiple disciplines. So does this require a change in how yeah, we I, I think, students? I think it does. But I want to I have a little bit of a, of a uh, bit of the nuance of the data. Because yeah. one thing that's striking is that in, in scientific research, of course, you have to have massive depth yourself, meaning that if somebody wants to become an, a, an economist who works on these issues, it's maybe 10 years of research before they really feel like they know it. Yeah. And that sort of depth is, it's hard to get that sort of depth across a bunch of different fields. <laughs> Unless you're some polymath, you right. just don't have the time to do all this. And so what was striking was that right. it, it may be the case that the best, the most scientific advances are the best scientific advances are going to come from teams of people who individually have depth, but who also have the ability to communicate yeah. with others outside of their outside of their background, and I think that's what maybe um, our, our educational system should prioritize. Which is yes, maybe allowing people to have some individual expertise, but having them, as you note, and have enough breadth that they actually can communicate with other people who have different expertise. Right, right. Yeah, so when you do the um, analysis of research papers, Scott, do you see a trend toward sort of interdisciplinary publications? or it's Well, our, in our study, we only looked at a snapshot. And so I should say that study, we knew what the yeah. field was like when we did the paper, but we didn't follow it up. Oh, sorry, that paper didn't follow it up across, uh, uh, across um, additional years. In some other work we've done, we've looked at this in a different field, um, different area of neuroscience. And there's some suggestion yeah. of that, but we're, uh, I would say I'm hesitating because I'm not always sure if the reason why the field changes is because of the field really becoming sort of um, more integrative or because the words we're using or the language used to describe things changes. So as, as researchers start to connect, they develop sort of common languages the way we talk about our research yeah. actually changes over time. Right, right. And um, I wonder, you know, the, the terminology, it can go both ways. So it can get integrated, but it could also take its own life. So we could have the same terminology in different fields. Yeah, meaning, absolutely. And that, you see that a lot in, in, in research areas like my own where we connect to different fields. An economist or a psychologist or a neuroscientist might use the term uncertainty or the term value. And they mean, mean 
sort of the same thing, but they mean sort of different things. And so we always have to create like a lingua franca, like a trade language. So we get some sort of common understanding across yeah. different, different disciplines in order to uh, communicate. And as someone who I still work, one of my closest co uh, colleagues is, a, is a, um, a traditional economist. And often when she and I talk, we have to uh, sort of define terms at the outset. And we always say like things like, oh, that's what you mean by X. And I would just encourage all people working in industry areas to just to try to meet the other person with a common language. Um, you do better science when you actually yeah. can communicate with people. Right, right. We'll take a quick break, uh, Scott. When we come back, we'll talk about a couple of your recent papers, uh, including the cognitive foundations of voter choice. Talk about right. communication. Absolutely. Gap. <laughs> This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Uh, Scott, we were talking about neuroeconomics, um, how the brain actually makes decisions, uh, where activities might be, how it deals with uncertainty, risk, what we mean by uncertainty, ambiguity, and so on. There's a lot of terms there that people have potentially different definitions for. Uh, but there are a lot of fields uh, thinking about this or looking at this and have an interest in this. Uh, you have a more recent paper um, entitled Issues or Identity, Cognitive Foundations of Voter Choice, and this is a fairly topical paper. So you say voter choice is one of the most important problems in political science. The most common models assume that voting is a rational choice based on policy positions, uh, such as key issues, and non-policy information, such as social identity or personality. Uh, though such uh, models explain macroscopic features of elections, they also reveal important anomalies that have been resistant to explanation. So what are the anomalies that you're talking about here? Well, one of the, the key things we all have observed over the last, let's say, we, it's obvious to say the last four years, but you could say the last decades, is yeah. that people's, people don't always vote in ways that at least superficially look like they support their self-interest. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, is, we can imagine that that um, there are segments of population who would benefit from different policies. So immigration restriction or immigration and liberality, um, uh, higher minimum wage, um, health care, whether health care is provided to more people or is, remains sort of the province of employers. So there's a whole host of issues, all the issues that people care about. And it, it has been striking to many people that how people vote doesn't always line up with their self-interest. I mean, there are many people who vote for high, well-off people who vote for higher taxes. Say. And so other things must be influencing the voter voter's decision. Hmm. Now, this is something that political scientists have recognized for decades. Um, and so I, I do not want to remotely imply that my lab and my colleagues and I have been like the ones identifying that as a problem, that, that's some, that problem's out there. Yeah. But we, a few years back, tried to think about solutions or ways of thinking about the problem. And previously, we had done some work, um, traditional neuroeconomic research, looking at how the brain plays games under social and non-social contexts. And we had found this sort of weird phenomenon, actually, in a, in a uh, examining people's behavior while they're playing a poker game, of all things, such mm -hmm. that there were some brain regions that were seen very, very selective to social contexts, almost like they would come on just when you're trying to identify, let's say, a social actor's um, a social actor's behavior, and but they weren't there when you're watching, say, a similar, identically played computer actor. Hmm. And this led to a line of research where we're trying to understand sort of under what cases does the brain sort of adopt a social context where economic considerations get pushed back and social considerations are come to the fore. Hmm. So with that idea, we thought, hmm, this could apply to politics. So in 2006, we actually uh, 
created a model, a, a pretty simple, but a mathematically specified model that would talk about the trade-offs between policy and identity. Yeah. And so we took the traditional models from political science, and that would be the policy part. But we basically said, this is how identity could enter into the process, such that if a vote reinforces some of your identities, hmm. then it may actually diminish the effects of policy upon your preferences. Right. So we argue that this is something that was neurally, neurally plausible because it's based on this earlier neuroscience, and it gave an explanation for why identity um, might be relevant for voting. And so this came out in October 2016, and so I, I did some interviews with and my colleague Libby Jenke, who's a political scientist, did interviews, and we talked to people about this, and people were very curious about how it applied to that election. And yeah. then we thought, oh, no, we, we better get collect that data because we meant this as like a, a theoretical model. So yeah. immediately before the 2016 election and immediately before the 2018 elections, yeah. we collected data on people's identities and their voting preferences. Right. And so this last year, we we published the follow-up, which it's a little strange to say is we published the, the theory before we published the data. <laughs> But the data reinforced or justified. And so in um, in these U.S. elections, both the 2016 presidential and the 2018 senatorial elections, the degree to which you saw your vote as as reinforcing an identity like mm -hmm. military, woman, um, Hispanic, et cetera, yeah. caused your the, your consideration of policy to diminish. And in the people most influenced by identity, policy was irrelevant. Right. Um, so we thought this this makes a lot of sense given the the sort of political environment of the last few years. And it also it also connects to things like Brexit, where if you look at the in England, for example, people who said their identity was English tend to be incredibly pro Brexit, whereas people who said their identity was British, even though their demographics were similar, tend to be right. anti Brexit. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't think a lot of people will doubt this. So, if um, if you have some sort of a prioritization policy positions against against identity, um, what we are finding is that, uh, if I understand this correctly, Scott, what we are finding is that identity has a higher value uh, when they make that decision. Well, actually, we find that it's, it's almost like a dial that you could turn from one extreme to the other. So huh. there are people, and we have a we had samples of roughly a thousand people that we collected via online, um, basically online uh, techniques. Immediately, like the twenty four hours before each of these elections, and within yeah. the samples, there are people who are fully policy and people fully identity. Hmm. But what's what's striking is that, and I want to emphasize this fact: it's not your demographics per se that causes you to be um, care about identity. It's the degree to which you see the vote as reinforcing of an identity. So if I see my vote for this particular candidate reinforces my identity as, say, a military veteran, mm -hmm. then that identity change tends to dominate in some people to the extent that policy similarity with the candidate is utterly irrelevant, has no bearing on how much you like the candidate. Mm -hmm. So in the, that's what I was saying was really striking is in the most extreme identity people, policy had no effect. Right. It's sort of problematic for democracy, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I, at the extreme, one could argue we have reached a state where we have half the population who wear blue shirts and half the population who wear red shirts, and they never change shirts. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in fact, they can make decisions without without any policy position uh, information. Yep. That this are fairly autonomous uh, in the you know in the current system. I'm talking about the U.S. Uh, politics uh, specifically, um, and so, uh, so so let me ask you that: uh, Are we getting closer to sort of an autonomous, uh, only identity reinforcing, uh, taking voting as sort of a therapeutic process, or uh, do we still have some policy? policy-based folks out there. So so we do, we do still have policy folks and and, yeah. folks, and I think that there's um there's there's both a bad and good of this. So the bad is of course what you're hitting at which is that the if 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 our voting becomes detached 
from our policy preferences, then that means that it's just a social signal. It doesn't actually help Then the elections and our democracy doesn't help us get to the greatest good. Right. And I think that's that's a real concerning thing. So that if, for example, I'm, 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 I don't know these data, but let's suppose it's something like 70 percent of Americans would support raising the minimum wage. And I should say I don't know those data. Um, yeah. I would be surprised if the true support for ra for raising the U.S. minimum wage matched the uh, people's expression in their political parties, because almost every issue of that sort tends to be favored by one party and thus by definition rejected by the other. So in a two-party system, I think this is pretty problematic. It also means that identity changes policy positions. And so we've seen this in like old time environmental issues. I mean, environmental issues used to be rural issues. It used to be perhaps even the 70s more Republican than Democrat. But it's completely flipped over the um, coming decades, whereas urban people are often more concerned about the environment than rural people, which is not what it was decades ago. And things like free trade in the last elections, free trade has switched between the parties, which is very odd. So I think that's a scary part. The positive parts are that if we know this is what's happening, then there may be ways of, of dampening its effects. And my own, my own hope is that that the way to solve this sort of polarization is going to be by a recognition, by sorry, by um, insertion of some people who are non-identity focused. So you can imagine if you have a crowd of people and half are Republicans, half Democrats, they don't get anywhere. But if there are a third Republicans, third Democrats, and a third people who care about policy but don't really give a damn about Republican or Democratic labels, yeah. That third group of, of sort of unaffiliated people actually can help lead the group to a better overall consensus. And that's what I think we have to do as a society, somehow figure a way to make it okay to actually yeah. not be part of either tribe, but to care about the policies. So is it is it less of a problem in uh, multi-party systems, uh, parliamentary systems, let's say France or something like that, yeah. or... Um, ultimately, wherever you look, you, you sort of have this two-party um, uh, party. Wait, party. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I, I have to give a disclaimer that I am not a political scientist. I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist or psychologist who works on some of these issues. So all my, I, I haven't done that. I haven't done those studies. My understanding is, yes, that it is the case that yeah. as you allow people um, sort of more granular expressions of their identities, then in those sorts of systems, you could, be, for example, primarily affiliate with a party that's pro-environment, but that party's part of a coalition that's maybe generally left of center. And so in those cases, it's going to be less like, you're going to be less likely to think of the other as just evil, as it is in modern American policies, um, and more likely to think of it as, an, as your party is an expression of your policy positions. Um, yeah. We have constitutional barriers, though, to changing to a multi-party system, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so my intuition is, I don't, I don't know much about this uh, at all, but it, it seems to me that having a third party fundamentally changes the dynamic. Uh, it will force the other two parties to be less, uh, as you say, identity-centric. Uh, because you have competition now, you, you, but what we don't have today is we don't have competition on the on the policy side. Yeah. You cannot win that <laughs> win that dimension. So, so you basically invest and focus on just on the identity side. Yeah. And in the you know with lack of competition, both parties do the same. Just the introduction of a third party could substantially change that dynamic. Yeah, th this is this is. Um... A, and sort of maybe a damning indictment of our, our limitations of our system in two ways. So one, you're, you're right that having third parties that were viable would change the dynamic of the U.S. system. However, we have what's called the first past the post system, which basically means that we everybody runs in the election and then whoever has the most votes wins. And there is no minority representation. And it, there's an, a theora, theorems in political science that basically say if you have a system like that, you only end up with two viable parties. And right. the third party has no real role in the system. And unfortunately, you need a parliamentary type system to get vi viable third parties. Um, I think that uh, I think that that if we had a, a 
other perhaps even ranked choice voting or other things like that, we might be able to make some some moves toward this. But right. until we do that, the system really is set up to to favor traditional two parties. And actually, one other quick note, it's even worse in the U.S. system with, with gerrymandered districts. And yeah. if the districts are highly gerrymandered, that means that many of our, say, U.S. House of Representatives, um, their biggest challenge is in the primary. And there's a lot of research that suggests in primaries, you really have to emphasize how extreme you are. And so the worry is that you push toward extremity in the primary systems, even if in, if you look at the entire electorate, a moderate would be more preferred. Yeah, and you can already see that before the, the next president is, um, is certified, uh, we have a few people running for 2024 uh, already. And uh, they have to take a, it's a rational decision. They have to take a very extreme position uh, so that they can win through the primaries. Yeah, it's a, it's scary. I think in many ways, I, 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 I feel like as a, as a behavioral scientist that the work we do can have some impact on marketing. It can have financial decisions. And, and in recent years, I've been trying to understand how in principle we could have impact on the political system because in fact, there's there's so much in our society depends on having strong political institutions, and behavioral science in many ways has had less effect there than in, for example, marketing. Right. Yeah, I want to go into another another topic, completely different. Uh, indulgent foods can paradoxically promote disciplined dietary choices. So, so that is counterintuitive, uh, Scott. So, so how did you find this? Yeah. So again, we're, we're broadly in my lab, we're interested in just how people make decisions and we care about things like decisions that involve trade-offs. And so one decision that, that many of us face commonly is a trade-off between, let's say, a tastier food that may not be as good for us or a healthier food that's not quite as tasty. And that's a core dietary dilemma that Americans face and fail at in many cases, yeah. billions of times a day. Um, and there's often been research on trying to understand how you increase self-control so people make the sort of more healthy food choices. And we're interested in this uh, this, this topic um, with an idea of can we use sort of um, biases that we know work in other contexts to push people's choices around so they make more sort of disciplined choices. And so we used a bias um, that's, that's sometimes seen where people want to like, uh, in effect, give themselves variety in outcomes. Yeah. And so what we did was construct a, a um, this gave you sort of the same choice under three different contexts. Hmm. So uh, in one case, you just make a choice between two foods, say um, salmon, which people might say is uh, like, uh, like bagged salmon. So it's reasonably tasty and good for you. And Oreos, which are really tasty, but not very good for you. Okay. So people might make a disciplined choice of the salmon or the indulgent choice of the Oreos. Yeah. Then sometimes we connect each of those foods to another food that is either, in one case, disciplined itself mm. or indulgent. Mm. So you might say they have the same pair of salmon and Oreos along with something like spinach or right. along with something like a candy bar. Right. And what was really, really striking, and we sort of expected the result but not how strong it was, was that if we paired, we gave people the same choice, yeah. and we paired it with the, the in this case, the um, indulgent foods, mm -hmm. then they became much more likely to make the discipline choice. One thing I should emphasize, it's not like they eat both these. The way we set it up was probabilistic. So <laughs> if you make a choice between this, you say you prefer the Oreos, um, and then I give you the other pair, you have a 50% chance of getting the choice between the Oreos and the salmon anyway. In other words, I'm adding something that is that shouldn't change your original preferences. Right. But it turns out to change your preferences really dramatically. It makes people twice as likely mm -hmm. to make a disciplined food choice. And so we could use a simple behavioral bias to really push people's choices around. Well, so 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 for my own understanding, so the the, the first choice, salmon versus the Oreos. You're saying, um, so it's sort of a controlled trial in the sense that uh, the, the first instance, you don't know what you're getting, right? There's a 50-50 chance? Yep. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, in this case, it's not. It's just, it's just. Um, you tell me which one you prefer. So you get, get what you, you get. What you want. Want. 
Okay. And the way we run the experiment is we actually have in our laboratory uh, a, a snack bar with all these foods. Yeah. And at the end of the experiment, we pick one of the trials randomly and they get it. They get whatever they chose in that trial. So if we pick that trial randomly, you chose the Oreos, you get Oreos. Okay. And we bring people to the lab hungry, and the only thing they have to stay for thirty minutes afterward. The only thing snack they get is one they chose. Yeah. So there's incentives to tell us the truth, right? And so they get what they want, and then they make a second choice later. Yeah, on different trials, and we we randomize all these to to be good little experimentalists. But on yeah. other trials, they might see the following: on the left side of the screen, there's Oreos, or sorry, salmon, yeah, and say spinach, and on the right side. There is Oreos and spinach. Yeah. And you can think of it this way. I'll flip. If, if this is a trial that gets chosen that we're going to play out at the end so you really eat something, I'll flip a coin. If I flip heads, yeah. whatever you chose, you get the Oreos or salmon. If I flip tails, you automatically get the spinach. Hmm. So if you have a preference of Oreos over, over salmon, you should pick that. The, that you're, you should make the same choice regardless of whether there's a chance of getting spinach or not. Oh, okay. And that's what's called a common consequence. Basically, it, it's there regardless of what you choose in the original. Right. So I can think of it as I might get Oreos, there's 50% chance I get spinach. I might get salmon, there's 50% chance I get spinach. Right. And, and these are adults, right? Not not kids. These are young adults, yes. So we've, we've done this. We've done variants of this in adolescence, yeah. but main studies are, are done in young adults. Um we we ask questions about whether they have dietary goals, and we even push around their goals by, in some cases, priming them for to think more healthfully, priming them to, to, to prioritize taste. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's striking is that although we can change their overall behavior a little bit, this basic effect that if you pair the foods with another dis, uh, another indulgent food, I should say, yeah. pushes people toward making a discipline choice, that effect is always there no matter how we run it. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, uh, as you say, you know, obesity uh, is a big issue uh, for the U.S. and probably for the rest of the world as well. Maybe half of our healthcare costs could be attributed to this this one issue. Uh, and so, do you see some practical applications of this to to potentially uh, to get a behavior change? Yeah, absolutely. We we one of my co-authors in this is Gavin Fitzsimmons, who's a marketer at Duke. And he's been very interested in these sort of effects because you can see them on menus. So, for example, often on a menu, there's a food paired with it. So oh, yeah. something like fries are paired with, with this. And there's a weird um, – we, we don't want people eating um, too much fries for obvious reasons. But there's a, there's a weird um, parallel here. If you could give people a, an automatic indulgent food that is not – as bad for them as fries. So for example, you have a choice between a healthy and a um, more tasty option, and you pair those with something like a mint, which is relatively low calorie, but still tasty. Yeah. The presence, we, we would predict the presence of that mint that would be present for both would push people toward the more disciplined food. And so we've we've basically just begun, somewhat interrupted by um, by pandemic limitations, trying to think through how we how we can actually test interventions, yeah, so that we can give people um, minor nudges that would actually change their real choice behavior in these cases. So, for example, McDonald's um, or, or uh, let's say a McDonald's or any other fast food place might be able, if they wanted to push people toward healthy choices. Mm -hmm. Pair foods with, again, very simple, low-calorie indulgent options to increase discipline choices. Right. Have you um, looked at, you know, if you were to uh, bring the economics dimension to it, the price dimension to it, um, do you see, is there a threshold price at which they will, they will fail? Um, you mean in the sense of like, would uh, would their willingness willingness yeah. to take a indulgent or disciplined food fail if it costs more? Is that the, the logic? Because it costs slightly more. Yeah. So we haven't we haven't done that experiment with food. Um, what I mean by that is we always try to keep uh, costs constant so we can get a sense of the relative trade offs between say taste and health. Um, you, um, cleanly. In some other cases, we tried to look at cost and budgeting, um, some other work, and, and, and that's more on like impulse purchases. And so we do think that changing costs and how you perceive costs 
can help with self-control and like impulse purchasing. And so my lab is doing some work related to that. But with food, we haven't done that yet. Um, okay. There's one, one worry in many cases that often the healthful foods, um, yeah. because they're less processed and have more natural ingredients, are a little more expensive. And so the worry <laughs> right. has been that that, um, that that does interact, but we haven't, we haven't tested that interaction. Yeah, I mean, if uh, if um, it's sort of question of a threshold value, right? So I'm, I'm thinking about Procter and Gamble and the other marketers, not just a restaurant. If if the economics for the producer is not significantly different, and they can actually extract a better behavior in the consumer, um, you know, it's revenue neutral for them. They they might go for it. Otherwise, it becomes more complicated. Yeah. I think that part of the problem is that in many cases, the producer's interests are not aligned with the consumer. So this is a little bit anecdotal, but um, whenever um, some fast food restaurants had to put calorie information in New York City, on, on um, th they ended up with young males tended to buy more unhealthy options. And the reason why is because they looked at the number of calories and saw they could get, in effect, more food for the same price if they bought the unhealthy option. So if you're seeking calories per dollar, the unhealthy foods are actually better, even though they're obviously worse for you in many other ways. And so the 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 producers may want us to purchase as much as possible and often the lowest cost for them to produce. And that may not be fresh food, which is going to be more helpful. Right, right. Yeah, so it could be uh, there could be some regulatory aspects here. Uh, but, you know, given that obesity is a real problem, um, maybe this is uh, something that regulators can think about potentially. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we showed in this study and, and in other studies is that that the, your choices depend upon where you're looking, what information you acquire during the decision process. And so one thing that's really striking is that even though regulators can't always influence exactly what's offered to consumers, they can often influence what information is presented, how it's presented, how it's marketed, and so forth. And so that may be one avenue by which we can help use behavioral science to get people to make better choices. We can't tell a company that they can't sell soft drinks that are horrible for you. Um, right. They can only sell um, water or something like that that is better. We consumers want to have pleasurable, uh, indulgent foods. Uh, it's one of the great joys of living. But the way in which it's presented to people might be something that regulators and policymakers can look at. Right. And may have applications, Scott, in even in the school uh, meal design, right? Um, you know, we have this antiquated uh, food pyramid, I think they still use. Um, this could be an interesting way to think about. Um, you know, how to construct the, the meal meal plans there, potentially. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I was uh, surprised when seeing how big these effects are is, is, is by the realization that, you know, we probably don't want to just simply think about limiting all indulgent foods. What mm -hmm. a better way to think about it might be to allow people to indulge, to sort of fulfill those goals, to have some healthy foods, but to moderate the calories or the, the degree of process of processed foods that come in those indulgent foods. That is, the core idea might be, we don't want to just try to get people to make better food choices by training their self-control, but by giving them the opportunity to indulge in ways that are going to have the least negative effect. And that's obviously for things like food choice in schools, the, way, the options you give kids, I mean, you're not going to tell kids they can't have any tasty foods, but you may be able to present the indulgent foods to them in a way that encourages them to eat more of the health, healthful foods. So, so what's happening in the brain in this instance, um, Scott? You know, is it sort of the guilt complex <laughs> of, 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 the, uh, of the stuff that you are going to consume and then you're kind of compensating for it? What, what exactly? Yeah, that's a wonderful it? question. So that's the one we don't know yet. So often in the laboratory, we want to like identify a behavioral phenomenon first, some feature of people's decision making. And then we try to understand the mechanisms of the behavior, um, maybe even without looking at the brain. So in this study, we actually were looking at how people make choices. We looked at their eye position, how they looked over the foods what they were looking at, which food in which order. And we run computer simulations to try to link these different parts of behavior into a story. But that tells us something about behavior, but it doesn't tell us something about the brain. 
And so a next step for us will be to try to understand what is actually changing in the brain when people see these indulgent extra foods. So how would the brain respond to a food change? And, and there's a little bit of work on other labs where people have done things analogous to that that gives us some, some targets to look for in the brain, but we don't have that answer yet. And so that's one of the really cool things about doing the science here is that there's just so much to look at that we can, yeah. we can find all kinds of interesting ways out in the world where people's choices don't line up. And we can study that at all different levels from what they choose, where they look at, how they talk to other people about it, and even what their brains do. And that gives us sort of an overall story for the processes of decision making. Yeah. So, so in conclusion, Scott, as you look forward in this emerging area of neuroeconomics, uh, where do you think uh, it's going to be sort of the most exciting uh, research, at least from your perspective? Where are you focused on? Yeah. So I think two areas. So one, yeah. a topic. So the topic that many of us care about deeply now is social decision making, how my choices depend upon what the choices say about me to others or based upon what other people tell me and so forth. And we just all now realize that so many of our decisions have a social component. Even if I'm the only one making the choice and I'm the only one benefiting it, I still think about what others, how they might perceive me if I make the choice. Obviously, with things like political decisions really matters. So that's one topic that's incredibly important, and we're going to spend a lot of time doing research on that. The other is trying to understand how to get an integrative uh, perspective. This goes all the back, back to what some of the things you and I talked about at the beginning. How do we yeah. take information about the brain and connect it to traditional economics or to marketing? And that's a really exciting area, but it's really hard. And so... Yeah. We want to have we want to do the research in the lab that matters, but not just matters only for science, which is important, but also so that it can have influence to help marketers present information more effectively to consumers. So we can have consumers develop rules that help them make better choices and so forth. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's really exciting idea. Um, would love to follow <laughs> your research as you go forward. Uh, excellent. Yeah, thanks so much for spending time with me. Scott. You are most welcome. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.